Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Stuff Look Good in Unity. This is Shaders 103, proving that some people actually can count to three. <coughs> Today we're going to look at replacement shaders. Replacement shaders are sets of sub-shaders in a single shader program that we can tell our camera to render using. When the camera renders with a replacement, every object will be drawn using the appropriate sub-shader from the passed in shader program. That all sounds a bit convoluted, so let's look at an example scene. Here we have a little green room with a table, chairs, and a lovely Utah teapot. There are three materials in this scene, one for each color. They are all using the standard shader in OPEG mode. Let's start by writing an interesting shader to replace the vanilla one with. I'll call this shader Show Depth. The goal of this shader will be to visualize the depth of each pixel in the scene in grayscale. We'll include a float2 in our v2f struct and call it Depth. In our vert function, we'll set the depth to this. In Shaders 101, I glazed over matrix multiplication for simplicity's sake, but now that you've seen nearly 20 minutes of shader tutorials, you're basically an expert. So let's dig into this a bit more. These vertex positions are coming from the object being rendered. They are in the local coordinate space of the mesh we're rendering. For example, a typical cube's vertices have values like this. Now if the cube is positioned at the origin and it's not rotated or scaled, the vertices would be fine to use as world space coordinates. But of course, things in video games tend to move around. So the first step to rendering any piece of geometry is to factor in this transformation from coordinates in the mesh's local system to coordinates in the world. This is called the model matrix, the M of our MVP matrix. With the vertex's position in world space, we now need to factor in the transformation of the camera, because of course we aren't viewing the world from the origin. You can think of this as transforming by the inverse of however the camera's been moved in the scene. For instance, by moving the camera left, we're moving the world to the right. This part of the transformation is called the view matrix, the V in MVP. The final step in transforming the vertices is to factor in the camera's field of view and the near and far clipping planes. Picture the camera's view frustum and the transformation that would take this shape into a cube extending from negative 1 to 1, warping all of those camera space points with it. This is called the projection matrix and it's the P of MVP. Okay, that's it for this detour on matrix transformations. If you want to really learn this stuff, you should check out Cat Lake Coding's write-up on matrices. It's a great walkthrough on this topic using familiar Unity concepts and code snippets. I'll throw a link to it in the description. Back to our shader, we're actually going to leave the P off of our MVP matrix, so each vertex will only be transformed into the camera's coordinate system. This means that Z values represent distance from the camera. The lower the Z value into the negatives, the further away it is. We'll flip the sign to get a positive value. Next, we'll multiply it by projection params.w. This is a handy uniform variable that simply means 1 over the far plane value of the current camera. We've now got a depth value ranging from 0 to 1. Any values outside that range would either be behind the camera or further than the far plane. In our fragment shader, we'll just return the inverted depth as the RGB components. This means that the closer pixels should be white, and as they approach the far plane, they'll fade to black. And that's our shader. Let's get back to our scene. Normally, we would slap our shader onto a material, and then put that material on an object, but we want to render everything the camera sees with the same shader. We'll set this up as a short script that we'll add to our camera. All we need is a public shader field, and then to call camera.setReplacementShader. In the onEnable method, we'll do a non-null check on the shader, and if it passes, we'll set that shader as the replacement shader for the camera. We'll come back to the second parameter in a bit, but for now, we'll pass in the string render type. The replacement shader stays as is until we reset it, so for our convenience, we'll do the resetting in the onDisable method. Back in our scene, we'll toss our new script onto the main camera and the shader into the public field. Then we can just disable and re-enable the script to apply the replacement. Whoa, that's bright. You can faintly make out the silhouette of the chairs, but this looks pretty useless otherwise. Remember though, projection params.w was a reference to the far clipping plane of the camera. Let's bring in the far plane and see what happens. Much better. We now have a nice little grayscale depth view of our scene. Even though many objects are using different materials, we're rendering them all using the same shader. Egads! Our materials had so many properties for color, specular detail, texture. Has all this been destroyed by the replacement shader? Good question. A nifty thing about replacement shaders is that all the material properties are actually maintained in the replacement shader. Let's add the color property to our depth effect, and then in the fragment shader, we'll multiply our final color value by the color property. Now check it out. We keep the colors set in each material, but still replace the shader with our depth effect. Okay, remember the second parameter of the set replacement shader function? Let's explore its behavior a bit. 
As mentioned earlier, the replacement shader should be a set of subshaders that replace the appropriate shader for each material being rendered. This is done using a tagging system. The second parameter indicates which tag to check for in the shader that is being replaced. We take that value and compare it against all the subshaders in the replacement shader, looking for a match. The first matching tag value in the replacement shader will be used. If no matching tag is found, the object is not rendered. Because we're using the standard shader in OPEG mode, they are all tagged with the render type OPEG. In our show depth shader, we've defined a subshader with the tag render type and a value of OPEG. This means all the OPEG materials will have their shader replaced by this subshader. But what about transparent geometry? Back in our scene, we'll create a glass material using the transparent mode of the standard shader. When we apply that to the teapot, we see a nice glassy object. Now what happens when we switch our replacement shader back on? The teapot disappears. Let's fix this in our show depth shader. Under the first subshader, we'll copy and paste the same subshader, but this time we'll change the render type to transparent. That's all we need to do to get the transparent teapot to appear in our scene again. This is great, but it doesn't really reflect the transparent geometry very well. It's also a bit strange to visualize the depth of transparent geometry, because transparent geometry typically doesn't write to the depth buffer. Back in our transparent subshader, we'll turn off Z-writing and add alpha blending. Now let's ditch the whole depth thing from the opaque subshader and just return the material color from the frag function. This looks a bit more reasonable. Our transparent geometry is actually showing some transparency, and now the color property on the glass material controls the color and visibility of the object entirely. If we don't want to write a new subshader for every single render tag in our replacement shader, we can just pass an empty string as the second parameter. This will replace each object shader with the first subshader defined in the replacement shader. Let's try another quick effect to get you thinking about the types of effects you can achieve with replacement shaders. In the scene view, you can expand this drop-down menu and view various ways to preview the scene. One of them is overdraw, select that. If you haven't seen this view before, it's drawing each object with an orange additive blend. The brighter the orange, the more pixels are being drawn on top of each other in that location. You can imagine using this effect in games, maybe as a mechanic in a stealth game, giving the player the ability to see through objects. Let's recreate this effect using replacement shaders. The shader won't be too different from the transparent variant of our show depth effect. We'll give this shader a Q tag of transparent, this guarantees our replace shader will render over top of the skybox. We don't have to worry about the render type tag because we won't be using tagging for this shader. We set Z test to always, meaning regardless of what's in the depth buffer, this will be drawn. We could also just disable writing to the depth buffer with Z write off, either one or both will be sufficient here. We'll define our blend mode as 1 1, which is an additive blend as I hinted at in shaders 101. We'll then define a color in the scope of the CG program and return it from our frag function. In our replacement shader script, We'll pass an empty string as the second parameter, since we just want everything to use the same subshader. We'll also add in a public color field, and in the onValidate method, we'll set that shader variable using the setGlobalColor function. This is useful when you need a variable in a shader, but don't necessarily need or want it to be a material property. Now we can apply this new shader as the replacement and see its effect. I did some experimenting with glow and various colors, and you can really start to imagine how you could use an effect like this in your games. There are many ways to add a unique style to your games, replacement shaders are one tool I don't see discussed much, so I hope this video has got you thinking about how you can use them to create some interesting effects. You can find the shaders and scripts used today in the link in the description. Also, this weekend is Ludum Dare 35. The Ludum Dare combo is a 48 hour game making extravaganza. I'll be participating and potentially streaming and or making a time lapse of my weekend, so be on the lookout for that. If you've got the time for it this weekend, I encourage you to join in and make a game for the competition. It's a fantastic challenge and it's a great way to complete something, especially if you've been feeling stagnant in your dev work lately. Oh, and I also set up a Patreon if you want to support my channel. I haven't set up proper reward structures yet, but I'm thinking mentions in the credits and early bird video access as potential bonuses. If it picks up, I can do other fun stuff like asset store giveaway raffles and bonus video content. Thank you very much to this week's patrons for your support so early on. And as always, thank you all for watching, keep on making those video games.